Hi, and welcome to another edition of Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva. Well, we've got a, uh, a show just filled with celebrity today. Uh, we've got an author here who has uh, uh, written a, a great new book, actually the second uh, one that she, kind of a follow-up to the first one she did, uh, Barbara Sternig, uh, who for many years, uh, about four years to be exact, worked uh, for the well-known gossip columnist uh, Rona Barrett, and we'll be talking a little bit about that later. Uh, most notably worked for... Uh, some 20 years for the National Enquirer, senior reporter for the Enquirer. And uh, Barbara has written a book uh, called Celebrity Secrets of a National Enquirer Reporter, Further Adventures on the Hollywood Beat. And it's published by Front Row Publishing. And we welcome Barbara Sternig to Studio 411. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you so much, Larry. Glad to be here today. Now, in this case, uh, being a, uh, a factual book uh, and not fiction, uh, I usually ask an author, well, what was the motivation for this book? Obviously, there are a lot of things going on here. I know you do a chapter, which we'll talk a little later about the anniversary of uh, Princess Diana's passing, but kind of uh, based on the success of your first book, uh, what was the motivation to follow it up with this one? Well, you know, actually, at the time that I wrote the first book, I had a lot of these chapters written, but the first book would, would be just too fat if I put everything in there. That's what I was advised by the publisher. So we kind of winnowed it down, so the first book would be a little bit smaller. And I, you know, those other chapters just sat there niggling away at me for so long, and finally I thought, you know what, I got I to gotta just re-enliven them. I have to resurrect them, update them, add a few more chapters in, and go with it. Just make it into a sequel. And that is really what my motivation was. I just hated to waste all those crazy stories and escapades and just let them die. I had to get them out there. Now, you worked for the Enquirer for, uh, which for those who don't know, and I can't believe that anyone wouldn't, uh, any check outline, uh, you know, of course, that. And uh, what's the other one there? The one I used to always like with the little bat boy. He used to always catch my eye when, uh, you know, the one I'm talking about? Was it oh, the you're, you're talking about the Wacky World News. Was it was a Wacky World? Yeah, it wasn't it was the Globe, yeah. The world yeah, I was. The bat boy and the, yeah. the, what was it, the, uh, the alien who walks with presidents and all those. Yeah, or, or the. I had an idea for one on the way home. You know, Bat Boy, you know, uh, gets confirmed by the Senate. You know, I just thought it would be... Uh, be <laughs> or, or Elvis Lives. That Elvis Lives, yes, world. exactly. Yeah, Always. We used to hear the, the Weekly World News had a, had a sort of a corner in the National Enquirer's headquarters, and we would hear them laughing their heads off as they made up this this fun stuff. You know, it was all just a big lark for them. And here we're being put through the mill with our research department, and they're just yucking it up, making up that funny stuff. Yeah, but everybody always used to confuse that stuff with the Inquirer stuff. Even though we did do some astronomy stories, um, we had Alan Hynek from the Dearborn Observatory in Chicago, who was our expert on that stuff. So I mean, you know, in the, those kind of stories in the Inquirer, they weren't, they weren't the, the three-headed uh, uh, boy with five legs or something like that. You know? Yes, your, yours was a few notches above that, but it was always an eye-catcher in the line, you know, the uh, uh, world will end, you know, next month, whatever. And then now uh, the world really feels like it is going to end sometime. <laughs> but, but that's for another another show. But you were a senior reporter uh, on the Enquirer. You started there in the mid-70s. You were there through uh, uh, 1995. Um, uh, seems like a long time, and yet it's probably been almost as long, if not longer, that you haven't been with them. Oh, exactly. I can't even believe that when I think about it. And some of those uh, escapades are still pretty fresh in in my memories you know but it was a lot of fun we had we had a, a, a great period to be working at the Enquirer because it was before what I call the tabloidization of the American media. We were kind of the only outlet doing that kind of stuff. And people, there were no television tabloids at that time. There were no ETs or Access Hollywoods or anything like that. The other tabloids were not around. It was just kind of the National Enquirer. And we were doing all the celebrity gossip and scandal. And that was really the speciality. That's why they brought brought me on board because of my background covering Hollywood. So I brought a nice big fat book full of contacts to the Enquirer and was able to get at a lot of the celebrities in order to get the sit-down interviews and access on the set and everything like that. So uh, yeah, it, it uh, really had, uh, it was a great era. We call it kind of the classic 
the golden age of the tabloids, that, that period. Absolutely. Now, uh, Chicago native, uh, broadcast journalism major at Marquette University. You were there, I guess, uh, I'm, I'm relating to a sports era. You were there uh, at a good time in, in college basketball for Marquette. Oh, my gosh, yeah. yes, of course. Who, who was the coach? Uh, I'm blanking. Uh, uh, yeah, it was Al McGuire. Al McGuire. I thought it was one. I wasn't sure which McGuire it was. Absolutely. You had guys yeah. like Dean yeah, Memminger yeah. and countless others. That was uh, a good time for uh, not only for education, hopefully, but also for uh, uh, collegiate sports at Marquette University. Yeah, uh, it was, even though they did not have football, but they certainly had basketball to fill in that gap. <laughs> how, how did they, um, uh, or rather, how did you wind up then gravitating to uh, Los Angeles? Well, you know, it was really sort of a personal reason. I had a great big old broken heart, and I put my back of my hand on my forehead and, you know, wailed a little bit, and then I said, I got I to gotta go someplace where I'm not going to be reminded of everything every minute. I want to go as far away as I possibly can without getting wet, and that ended up being L.A., so uh, that's how I ended up here. And I started out actually writing and reporting news on KFWB, an all-news radio station, but uh, one of the executives at the radio station kind of eyed the way I, I wrote stories, and it turns out that his wife was uh, was a writer for Rona Barrett's TV show, and so she was being shifted over to be the editor of Rona's magazine, and so there was an opening there, and so he suggested me to Rona, who then hired me, and that's how I kind of ended up doing Hollywood instead of regular news. And Rona Barrett, my goodness, I was telling somebody the other day that uh, I can remember uh, Channel 5 out of New York, which in those days was a metro media station, as probably the one out in California uh, before it became, long before it became a Fox affiliate. And Rona, about 1040, you can tell even in my youth I was allowed to stay up to uh, watch the news, which in some ways with the Vietnam War and the uh, civil rights movement and with college uh, uprising, whatever, it seemed like a, <laughs> seemed like compared to today, a much quieter time. But one thing, it? yeah, well, <laughs> well, you have to be our age to really relate to that. But indeed, Amen. indeed, it does. But one thing that always kind of brought things back to earth was, you know, them throwing it to uh, Rona's uh, pre-taped segments. And uh, again, she was kind of. Um, a pre a, a four minute or five minute precursor to the uh, what became like uh, uh, what's that one with um, Mary Hart X uh, oh, yeah. uh, Entertainment uh, Tonight. Tonight yeah yeah only oh absolutely no oh. she was definitely a pioneer and greetings everyone yeah exactly <laughs> Barrett in Hollywood yeah exactly she she was a character she you know the stuff that that I still have all the scripts believe it or not and it seems so tame now but it was really spicy at that time and. You know, we even reported that John Lennon was having an affair with May Pang, which was roundly denied and later admitted. And, you know, we, you know, we broke some big stories. And, and uh, But it, as you say, it was the only game in town. And we, ha we have a shot of Rona for those who say, I know the name, but I can't remember. There's Rona. My goodness. Now, what happened with Rona where... Uh, to me, a big mistake, and by then you were probably already working for the Enquirer. I know you were. Um, she got hooked up with Tom Snyder on the oh, Tomorrow I Show, that. yeah. and that seemed like a major, that was like almost as bad as Barbara Walters and Harry Reasoner on oh, ABC. Yeah, it was a total personality conflict. It was a, a contest of the egos, and, you know, I, what was the worst part of it, uh, uh, in all of the broadcasts that they did, was one time when Tom... Uh, Snyder said something that really frosted Rona, and she just let the air go dead, which is a mortal sin in broadcasting, as you know. And then, and then Snyder started laughing the way he did, or no? <laughs> I don't think so. I think it was just left wow. air, and I think that was the end of her career with, with Tom Snyder. That was the Tomorrow Show, which was a pretty good show, but then they changed it to Tomorrow, I think it was Coast to Coast. And again, I didn't see a lot of it because, of course, it was it was on late at night, like 12, 30, 1 o'clock. But clearly the, the vibe you got was that that was not a match made in heaven. Uh, no, it, no, it wasn't. And, yeah. you know, he was a great broadcaster, but he was a solo kind of a guy. Exactly. And so, exactly. Was, and so was Rona. And yep. so that was very ill-advised, putting them together. But they probably thought it would work out without 
giving it too much thought, unfortunately. And then how did you, after about four years, how did you go from working with Rona then to uh, going to the National Enquirer? Obviously, at that point, you had, you had some contacts, some experience to draw upon. Yes, definitely. Well, I, after Rona, they were just starting the People's Choice Awards, and I, I think they're still doing that. But anyway, the, Bob Stivers, who was the creator of the People's Choice Awards, was looking for people with Hollywood contacts, and uh, so he hired me to come on and help produce that show and get the c celebrities to come and appear on it. So after that was over, I, you know what, I had a friend that was a magician who invited me to come and be his assistant and this long contract at sea, I don't know, eight or nine months. So I thought, oh my God, well, I haven't got anything else going on, I'll do that. Long story short, when I came home from that that time at sea, I, I really just had to get my feet back on dry land. And before I had left, the National Enquirer kept on offering me a job. They were just starting up their bureau here in Los Angeles, and I kept on turning them down because I thought, oh gosh, after working for Rona and People's Choice, I, I just don't think I can work for the National Enquirer. It's kind of it's kind of mewing. It just kind of gave me the creepy feeling. So I kept turning them down. Well, I came back from the magician, I thought, I have got to get a job to get myself grounded. So they were the only ones that were offering at that moment. So I stepped into the office on a tryout. And you know what? It just, it just wowed me. The people that were working there, the journalists, most of them were British journalists hired right off of Fleet Street. These guys knew what they were doing. They, they didn't have Hollywood contacts. That was the one up that I had on everybody. They knew how to get a story, but they just didn't have the context to work in Hollywood. So I was really able to make a mark very early there and got sent out on some really plum assignments, which I was able to ace. And and uh, then I, the more I did it, the more I just really enjoyed it. And, you know, we had a publisher named Generoso Pope Jr. He was the founder of the, of the paper, and he loved reporters, and he loved editors. He loved those who went out there and got the stories. And so he paid us extremely well, way more than any other person in journalism in Los Angeles at that time was, was making, even more than editors at the LA Times. So this was one great benefit, you know, to, to a young journalist. And besides that, we were given all the support in the world. We, he gave us an endless expense account to put us on the ground wherever something was happening. And any help we needed, we had it. We, you know, it, it, no expense was spared to help us get our stories. So I really enjoyed it. And, you know, even though it was hard working for the Inquirer, because after the acceptance I had coming in the front door to all the events, then to be really sometimes downright abused and, be, and people were especially a lot of celebrities could be extremely rude to you because they didn't want to, to be interviewed by the Inquirer. But, you know, you just had to dig in and, and just get bloody-minded about it and not take no for an answer until you got your story. And so that's really how it all happened. Uh, it was kind of just a progression. I never intended that, but the pieces just fell into place. And I, I originally thought I would stay there about six months, you know, pay off my credit cards, pay off my car. Instead, I left 20 years later. <laughs> nice. Barbara Sternig, author, uh, former uh, senior reporter for the National Enquirer from 1975 uh, to 1995. And uh, her book, Celebrity Secrets of a National Enquirer Reporter, uh, published by Front Row Publishing. Uh, for more information on Barbara and the book, uh, www.barbarasternig.com. Um, there was a story, and we have an image of the gentleman. Uh, uh, many uh, folks uh, remember him as uh, Frank Cannon or Jake and the Fat Man, uh, William Conrad. Uh, that was a story that kind of helped you, uh, one of the first stories that got you uh, your feet wet uh, with the Enquirer. Oh, you know, I know we were talking before, a lot of the young people have never heard of William Conrad. He was even old when I was first, you know, starting to do the, the Enquirer things. But uh, our grandmothers, I think I say in my book, even our grandmothers knew very well who he was. He was the original voice of Matt Dillon on radio Gunsmoke. 
and he kept up his career. He was a, he had a wonderful presence and you know a lot of authority, and he played this character Cannon. So it turns out he was my boss's generoso pop juniors, one of his two favorite stars in the world, William Conrad. So he had a standing brief that any reporter that could get an interview with William Conrad would get a bonus and would get a lot of brownie points. And so I thought, well, you know, I happen to know very well William Conrad's press agent. He's a good friend of mine from all my years at Rona. I called him up, and the only reason he arranged this interview was because he trusted me, he knew me, he put me right on the set. And he said, yeah, but, but uh, don't ask him anything too personal, you know. And so, you know, it turns out that William Conrad said he would just talk about anything he felt like talking about. And so what did he talk about? He talked about how he intended, after this season, to quit this show, even though it was the number one rated show, Canon. He intended to walk. And Quinn Martin, who produced it, didn't even know it yet, but he wasn't going to come back for another season and just forget about all the issues that other people might have with that. He couldn't stand to say, hi, this is Frank Cannon, one more time. <laughs> I, I'm standing there going, oh, my God, what am I going to do? He just gave me this big scoop, and I kept looking over at at Skip Heineke, who was the PR guy, and he didn't even know what Conrad was saying. And all of a sudden, his ears perked up, and he started to hear the conversation. Well, anyway, he said, well, you know, you have to use your own judgment. As we were driving back, he said, don't get me in hot water with Quinn. He's my client, too. You know, I do, can you handle it with kid gloves? And I said, oh, of course I will. I, you know, I just, I was really in a quandary how I would write the story. But I wrote it. As I was told, I quoted William Conrad. The boss loved it. He gave me a great big bonus. My my cap set at the Enquirer, I was really going for it. And just as it turned out, thank God, some other story. That's right. Skip asked me, whatever you do, if you could just make sure it doesn't get on the front page. Well, I couldn't really guarantee that. As it happened, a reporter walked in with some big romance story that bumped my story off the front page. So everybody was happy, and especially me. <laughs> and obviously, William, William, William Conrad uh, sounds like a guy that knew exactly what he wanted to happen. And, uh, and of course, later, I don't know, uh, is it bad to be uh, referred to as Frank Cannon or the Fat Man? I'm not sure, because <laughs> later on, he went to Jake and the Fat Man. So, and I know he wasn't Jake, because that was, I think that was, no, he was who was that, Joe Penny? <laughs> His friends even called him the fat man even before that show. Oh, that's, man. That's why. Yeah, and he was a big portly guy, you know, with a mustache and gruff and didn't smile very much. He, he, they should uh, Google William Conrad, anybody who doesn't remember or never heard of him. <laughs> he was uh, certainly a character. One, one trait I saw about you and I can relate, I said this is why uh, I hit it off with this lady from uh, the beginning. Uh, broad curiosity, okay, uh, broad meaning uh, extensive, not her, okay? Okay, broad <laughs> curiosity. Okay, and so I can relate to that, and I, I think that in your line of work, uh, maybe maybe in what I'm doing here, uh, or Lord knows I don't know what I'm doing here sometimes, but but broad curiosity certainly uh, is something that is needed. Do you think that um, the skills that you developed or that you look back and say that you have now over the years that those still apply to the way um, gossip columnists or things are handled today, or is today kind of no filter, whatever sticks to the wall, just throw it out there? Well, I think it's become a lot meaner. Uh, people thought the Enquirer was mean. I have all the old back issues. Oh, my God, it seems totally tame compared to the stuff that is talked about, even choice of vocabulary, which is used. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of stories that were just too prurient or were not just in the worst possible taste, were squelched at the Enquirer uh, in those days. You know, I really don't know what it's like there now, but the rest of the of the popular press, I think, doesn't hold anything back. Uh, certainly not even use of certain words. And and uh, yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's much meaner today. I think it's much more intrusive. And why? That's one word: technology. There is n everybody's a journalist now. Everybody has a cell phone that takes pictures. Nobody can make a move without being photographed. And that's, that's proven by even some of the, I don't know if you saw the latest thing, some girl that Harvey Weinstein lured into a room 
put on her cell phone and has pictures of him hugging her behind her back. I mean, you know, so there's no privacy. It doesn't matter how much you think it is, there isn't anymore. So that wasn't true in those days. Uh, we had to dig a little bit deeper, and we had to rely on people's ability or willingness to talk to us uh, and give us quotes and let us in on the story if they would, even if we somehow had to say, you know what, we already have most of the goods, we're going to run it with you or without you, you might as well have some input here and, and mitigate it how you might want to. So, yeah, I think I think it's changed immensely now. I'm sure everybody who's been around for a number of years will will relate to that even in their own life. A couple of guys that uh, from uh, our neck of the woods here in Connecticut, uh, the first gentleman, uh, give me a little brief uh, synopsis on him, uh, born in my uh, birth town of Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, many, many years ago, Robert Mitchum. You had a nice, uh, nice conversation with him while your recorder was recording feverishly. It's amazing the batteries uh, didn't run what? out. I would say he is probably my favorite celebrity that you're certainly in the top three. This guy was such a great guy. He, he was he was just a terrific man. Yeah, I met Robert Mitchum at a chili cook-off, believe it or not. I, he just happened to pull up and sit next to me at the dinner, and, and there were all these sort of semi-movie star ladies, older ladies across the way from me who, when they found out that I was with the Inquirer, even though I was an invited and credentialed guest, um, they started to do put downs on me and be really mean and rude to me. Well, you know, so Mitchum sat there next to me for a while. We were chatting, and he heard these ladies making these, you know, kind of mean remarks. And finally, he turned to me and said, "You know, Barbara, would you like to join me outside for some fresh air?" <laughs> And so he pulled my chair out, and out we went, and we spent the rest of the evening together. And you know what? It was just, just chatting, just talking. He talked. So, he told me so many things, and we were just wandering around this big sort of, I don't know. It was almost set up like a ranch or something like that. And we were wandering around in amongst the buildings and the patios and things, and and. Uh, Finally, I, I realized, uh, you know, he's telling me, I, I just have to ask him if he would mind if we interviewed. I had my tape recorder in my purse, and I said, gosh, you know, I, I hate to just ask you this, but would you mind if we just did a little interview? I'd love to get a story in the Inquirer about you, because I knew that he had just rescued a girl in some natural disaster in Mexico somewhere where he just happened to be and he had rescued a child out of some rubble and never talked about it but I had seen a blurb about it so anyway we started to chat and he gave me this most wonderful interview not only about that but just about what it's like to be a celebrity how how it had impacted his private life over the years and you know how he took it in his stride um, when people would not really be approaching him because they liked him, but because he was famous. You know, all of these kind of intimate thoughts and philosophical opinions about what life is like for a celebrity. So anyway, I, I loved Robert Mitchum, he, and he was such a courtly gentleman. He really was. I, people don't know that about him, I don't think, because he did a lot of villain roles or scary roles or detective roles. But you know, he was a real match, that guy. Uh, one thing about Mitchum, I think it was on the, the old Dick Cavett show. Um, I don't even know if there's a, a video of it, but anyway, the story has always been told that he comes on the show and basically, you know, while he was talking with you, obviously off camera, the fact that a recorder was going obviously didn't, didn't bother him. He goes on a network talk show, and I even saw him one time on Carson, and on those shows, he was like a man of few words. I mean, he was on Cavett, and basically the, for 20 minutes it was nope, yep, nope, yep. yep. And then at the end, he, they go to break. Cavett is sweating bullets, and Mitchum leans over during commercial and says, oh, you know, did I do a good job? <laughs> and it's just like, you know, it's it's like uh, it must have been the longest 20 minutes of uh, Cavett's talk show career, you know? But, you but know, with I, you, I, you know, I, he opened I, up. Yeah. We have a photo of Barbara back in the day. It was from uh, when you were at some um, record event with uh, George Carlin. Oh, yes. 
<laughs> and uh, if we can pull that up, that's uh, Barbara in her youth. Uh, <laughs> The eyelashes are quite extraordinary. There you go. They're quite but, extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. How about the, how about yeah. I can oh. see. Uh, I don't think you get too many refusals uh, uh, with uh, with that outfit. I got to tell you. <laughs> I got to oh tell God. you. But, it sure um, was fun to be young in those days. Fashion was too much fun. There you go. Barbara Sternig, author, uh, former senior reporter for the National Enquirer from 75 to 95. Barbara has authored a, a marvelous book, Celebrity Secrets of a National Enquirer Reporter, published by Front Row Publishing. For more information, barbarasternig.com. Um, another one, another uh, hometown hero, I guess. Uh, I don't know if there's any street signs being put up in his honor, but guy that um, uh, was a big broadcast, the radio broadcast guy back uh, around the time I was coming into the planet, uh, Bob Crane, who many oh knew as Hogan's, uh, Hogan's hero, or Hogan out of Hogan's heroes. Yeah. And uh, uh, briefly, you talk about, again, an interesting character. Again, I, I, I think he would be literally eaten alive if, uh, you know, his story were to be told today. Oh, my uh, gosh, yeah. I, I think we'll leave it to the readers to kind of, to kind of yes. uh, you know, get the gist of what's going on. But, uh, you know, Crane was uh, an interesting guy. And uh, uh, did you ever get a chance to uh, meet him or no? No, I never met him. I, I didn't. I, I had his home phone number, as I say in this book yeah, that I've written. But, uh, yeah, the story is uh, is to be read. Uh, you know, it's the dead can't defend themselves, you know. But uh, it, he was a massive star. Hogan's Heroes was a huge, huge hit show. And I think it was a, a big uh, shock when he died the way he did and everything. And unknown, it's never been solved, that murder. But, yeah, that that's a chapter that I... I remember that chapter very, very well. My uh, my floor manager this evening, Ken, was was reminding me that uh, 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 one of the two uh, women that played the character Helga, that was the oh, yeah. Colonel Kling's secretary, was actually his wife in real life. And there's always been speculation, again, uh, uh, not to demean the living or the dead, but there's always been uh, rumors about, because uh, his case is basically is one of those unsolved mysteries as to how he uh, met his demise, but needless to say, it was uh, was not a uh, not a pleasant uh, circumstance. But uh, No, and it was know. definitely a murder, but, uh, but it's, the murder has never Right, happened. and uh, during that time, I mean, that must have, as I recall, that must have been, uh, you know, uh, front page news for, you know, w days and weeks on end yes. as far as the Inquire. And every so often it comes up, even with DNA analysis or whatever, but they've never been able to, uh, you know, definitively, uh, uh, you know, come up with the, with the, uh, the killer and at this point may never. But, but uh, just wanted to mention a guy that, again, had a lot going for him, and I, I just don't know what, what went wrong there. But, uh, you know, Bob no, Crane. Bob you Crane. know, I know I was around him at different parties, even though, I mean, you know, I was just kind of a, another guest there. He always seemed to be such a, I don't know, congenial, jovial sort of person. And uh, there's, there's other sides to every human being, I guess, and that's what nobody knows. So. Uh, another gentleman, actually, uh, I think I see uh, his photo up now. Uh, just briefly, a lot of folks, even I must admit, I know the name, a gentleman who was the um, uh, epic producer, a music uh, producer of the Four Seasons and many other acts, a guy named Bob Crew, uh, who um, you knew quite well and uh, left us a few years ago. Again, uh, he's mentioned in the book. And uh, share a, a brief memory about, about your friend. Oh, Bob, he was just, you know, he, if, if anybody saw Jersey Boys, he's he is portrayed in Jersey Boys, and I thought very accurately. Um, he was just one of those magical people. He was not only loaded with talent, he was gorgeous. He was a big, tall guy, blonde, gorgeous. Everybody was in love with him, men and women. He preferred men, but every girl was also in love with him. He was a music genius. He was the, the genius behind the Four Seasons. He created their sound, really, and was their producer. And then later he had, a, he had his own group called the Bob Crew Generation. I think that was maybe in the, I don't know, maybe the early 70s. But he used to hold salons at his apartment in West Hollywood, which was very close to where I lived at that time. And... and uh, you know, there would be a, 
a constant parade of musical talents going through there. They'd sit down at the piano and start composing songs. Uh, you know, the, the song, some of the songs people would remember that Bob Crew uh, created besides the Four Seasons. He wrote Lady Marmalade. Do you remember that one? Over oh, uh, Patti LaBelle and uh, Nona Hendrix. Yep. Yeah, the LaBelle, as uh, they call themselves, yeah. Exactly, but even if you go way, way back, um, he in his early, early youth, in the 50s, I guess, he wrote Silhouettes, which was one of the early, early rock and roll songs that you find on these oldies collections. I was going to say, was that the dubs? I'm blanking right now. Might have oh, been the I don't dubs. know. Yeah, was it? Yeah. Oh. yeah, two silhouettes on the shade. Yeah, was that, yeah that's how exactly. it ended. Yeah. So he was, no, he was a great guy, and I had a very wonderful encounter with him, which I talk about in the, in the book, which I will always remember so well. Barbara Sternig, author and a former uh, National Enquirer senior reporter, uh, joining us for the hour here on Studio 411. Uh, the book, Celebrity Secrets of a National Enquirer Reporter, Further Adventures on the Hollywood Beat, published by Front Row Publishing, barbarasternig.com. Um, we're going to focus uh, in on, on three, uh, three individuals. Oh, I have to ask you, worst movie that you ever, uh, that you paid to see and then you had to uh, actually talk to the person about it? Oh, gosh, worst one. Would it be like Lost Horizon or uh, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> I can't of, think of a worse one. Than or that. Uh, Ishtar, remember, perhaps, maybe? Uh, I remember some great ones that I had got to talk to yeah. people after. But, but that's got to be tough when, when someone asks you and you're like, you know, oh, you're like trying to always be a confidant to them and they're like, oh, well, uh, I'll just pick somebody like Anthony Quinn and they say, oh, what'd you think of my last movie? <laughs> and you, what do you want to say? Yeah, thank God I never had that uncomfortable situation. Yeah. No. <laughs> and be best advice you ever got from a career standpoint in terms of this this line of work that, that you uh, eventually fell into. Best career advice. Who gave the that to you? Best career advice. Remember, we are a results-oriented organization. That has stuck in my mind forever. Results-oriented. So you do not take no for an answer. You keep going until you get your results. And I, I think I have a natural kind of a uh, stick-to-itiveness in my character. I just I believe in finishing what you start and getting the goods. And so, but that really, that, that way of saying it kind of hit me. And that was given to me actually by my, my editor at the National Enquirer, who was the first editor when I first joined the paper. And, and that really kind of expressed everything about working at the Enquirer. We are results-oriented. And that's and because you, know, you, you have broad <laughs> curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and yeah, and I have a, I've always had a complete native curiosity. Not mechanical, I don't take things apart, but I just want to know stuff, and I still, I'm still exactly that same way. I travel all the time, and I just want to know what that place is all about. I mean, I even spent five weeks in Burma wow. <laughs> because I just wanted to know about it. Well, I can cross that worst trip ever, Burma. Okay, so no, no, I'm sure it was very educational. Uh, we had a, it was a uh, culture shock. I'll tell you. Oh, I'm sure we had a comedian and a, a, a business entrepreneur, a millionaire, a hundred times over, Rhonda Shear on the program not long ago, and uh, we touched upon one of the people that helped her, and uh, actually uh, someone um, else who's been on the show, Victoria Hallman, you and I were talking about her from Hee Haw Days, another yes, one that yes. was was helped by this next gentleman that you write a little bit about, uh, Bob Hope. Again, Bob, you know, amazing, kind of like the, um, almost like a, the disciple of comedians, you know, and it's amazing how uh, not even 20 years after his passing, you know, so many people kind of forget who Bob Hope was and what he did. Uh, that set aside, uh, you know, did you find him to be a nice man in your dealings with him? Oh, in my dealings with him, I, he couldn't have been any more gracious. He was probably one of the very best interviews that I ever did. His home here in Toluca Lake is very close to my home, although I might live on a different street, so to speak. But um, but anyway, you know, so he said, well, look, why don't you just come over for lunch with his press agent, which was Frank Lieberman, and um, 
we'll have lunch in the in the playroom. He called it the playroom, where he had all his awards, and he could. It was it had a big bay window overlooking his his putting green that was his backyard, and and his chef served us this fantastic lunch, gorgeous. It was all of Bob Hope's favorites: lamb chops, asparagus. And lemon meringue pie. Oh wow! You got you won me with that. Let me tell you. Oh my gosh! Well, anyway, he just—he was such a past master. He'd been in the business for so long. He was in his late seventies at this point, and you know, he just—he he almost anticipated my questions. I, he knew what the topic of the interview was going to be. His close brushes with death in all of his meanderings around the world to put on shows for the troops. And he, boy, I'll tell you what, he just gave me such an amazing, amazing story. No, he really was. Uh, he had hidden secrets, like I suppose everybody does. And certainly this is something that uh, you'll have to read in the book about. But uh, my encounter with him was just amazing. And he afterwards, how gracious was he? He said, well, Barbara, would, would you like to? I'd been dying. I'd been going by his house ever since I lived over here, you know. You couldn't even see up behind the high hedges. The house is still there. I, I just I just read, I believe, in 2018, I think the house uh, was just sold, I don't know, I assume for the second or third time, but someone just purchased the property either from the estate because his wife passed away. I don't know. It's got to be at least seven, eight years ago. Yeah, so I believe the, uh, the family had it, and now someone has purchased that home for uh, uh, quite a significant amount of money. Quite as I think it's twenty three million something wow. like that. But uh, yeah, it has very high hedges. The hedges are still there, and there was a there was a driveway entrance, and there was a, a, a sort of a building there, and it was sort of like the keeper's gate. You, when you drove up in your car, you had give your information who you were and whether you were invited or if, if you weren't they were always nice to you i went up there a few times with house guests to show them bob hope's house but of course you were turned away and had to back out again but uh, that time now i maybe they took my car and parked it and we went into his offices which he had right next to the home and here larry were probably 20 filing cabinets and you know what was in those filing cabinets I would say, I would say yeah like uh, Joan Rivers jokes uh, Milton Joke. Earl jokes yeah yes all of the jokes and, and filed and, according to subject matter beautifully filed and kept in a great order he must have had every joke he ever told in those filing cabinets and, and I'm sure you know better than I because obviously you've been you've been living out there for a long time uh, the the staff of joke uh, writers that he had I mean I would say. You know, other than Sid Caesar's gang that he had on his television show, oh, but yeah. but Hope had these people literally on salary for like decades. I mean, decades. You know, what do you do for a living, young man? Uh, I'm 80 years old. I write for Bob Hope. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, I mean that's 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 a pretty good gig. You know, you sit home on the recliner and write jokes. You know, that's, exactly. Even yeah. Frank Lieberman, his press agent, had been with him 41 years. Wow. Yeah. So, 41 years. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, you know, he had a sense of uh, loyalty to his people, um, and I think he must have been pretty nice to work with. Um, the, the personal side, you know, read my book. <laughs> Uh, we see a lot of uh, celebrities with substance abuse issues, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's the one I was going to mention to you, uh, like uh, back in the early 80s, before it really was understood, you know, the uh, Karen Carpenter type of uh, illness, uh, anorexia, nervosa, um, that was really one that I'm sure threw people for a loop. I know you guys must have had a field day with trying to cover that, but uh, is it because of the instantaneousness with social media and to be honest with you, the celebrities don't help their case because they have Twitters, they have Facebook, they have uh, Instagram. I mean, they almost ask for the abuse that sometimes they get because they just expose their entire life to uh, scrutiny. Yeah, it's almost like a goad. It's a, it's goading the responses, and uh, it's I think it is considered to be a plus to have five million followers or something like that that makes their next uh, salary higher and. So that's why they, they have people that do that. I don't know that they personally do these postings, um, but uh, or maybe they just pass it along to somebody. Yeah. And they don't take the replies. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the privacy part has always been the issue, I think. And I've talked to so many celebrities about that. And, 
you know what they say is that's a trade-off. The older ones used to realize that. I don't know that the younger ones realize that so much. The older stars, the classic stars that were still out there when I was a young gal starting out, you know, Lucy Ball and lived on a Roxbury Drive up in Beverly Hills. She didn't even have a fence around her house. You know, and Jimmy Stewart lived in a sort of a brick home there, and Jack Benny uh, uh, was an old guy by that time, but he didn't have a fence around his house. They all lived like on that street. The people just lived uh, normal lives, more, much more than they do now. Now they're behind gates and have bodyguards and guards and, you know, all sorts of electronic stuff to guard them. And that's not the way it was then. Privacy in the older days was more respected, I think, by the public. And you didn't have the paparazzi chasing the way they started to, maybe in my days, you know. Um, and uh, I, th I think it's it's been an issue for them, and I think it's a hard one. That's the trade-off. You want to be fame, famous? Well, the price is you have to be accessible to those who made you famous. And a lot of payroll for all those people on the uh, on the books because oh my you have gosh. a lot of people. Uh, Barbara Sternig joining us here for the hour on Studio 411, author, a former National Enquirer reporter, the book Celebrity Secrets of a National Enquirer Reporter. Um, who would you pick? A short answer, living to have a sit down dinner and talk with someone uh, that you have never met that is living. Who would you pick? off the top of your head to sit down and spend the evening with? Lady Gaga. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think she's such a character and she's reinventing herself. I thought she, when I heard Lady, my mind went to, oh, somebody royal. Okay, well, in a, in a, in a sense, but yeah, I get it. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, uh, I think she's a great character. How about who would you pick uh, someone who's no longer with us uh, that you never met to have a sit-down dinner with and catch up with? Oh, that I never met. Could I choose somebody that I have met instead? Sure, go ahead. Marlon Brando. Yeah, I, I was very good friends with the Brando family, although Marlon was not often there. But, uh, you know, he was... You mean, uh, you mean physically or mentally? Which, which I part? mean physically, okay. yeah. Okay. No, he would be there mentally. He was okay. very, very attached to his family. I, I've been very good, good friends with them for many, many years. But, uh, yeah, he, he was not... Um, he was very, very standoffish and private, even in his own home if there were other people around. But he did love a joke, I'll tell you that. He, one time on an Easter, it was, everybody was over at his uh, ex-wife Movita's house, which he was still very close to. He has two children with her, Miko and Rebecca. Anyway, so Marlon was there and he said, okay, got us everybody into the living room. So, okay, everybody has to tell a joke. Everybody in this whole room, think of your joke now, and we'll go around in a circle. So we went around in the circle, and uh, Marlon started out, and he told some hilarious joke, and Movita was, she was almost gagging with laughter. She was laughing so hard, we thought she was going to pass out. And Marlon said, well, well, Movita, I think it's very strange that you're laughing like this. You're the one who told me that yeah. joke. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously he likes her own material. There you go. There you go. Oh, my God. We're going to get a little serious here in our remaining moments with Barbara Sternick. Um, uh, one story that is a little bit more in the headlines. Actually, both are, but for different reasons. Uh, in 2018, of course, uh, uh, the uh, whole Me Too, gener uh, Me Too uh, scandal, I should say, not Me Too generation, uh, kind of uh, is continue to uh, raise its ugly head, uh, uh, certainly with, with just cause. And uh, 2018 saw a uh, celebrity icon, America's dad, as some called him, Bill Cosby, uh, get uh, convicted of sexual assault and uh, sent off to prison. Uh, you uh, talk a little bit about Cosby uh, in the book. Uh, let me just preface it by saying good, bad, or indifferent. I've been fortunate enough to have two guests on the show, one off the record in private and another one on the show that both had shall we say, encounters with Mr. Cosby. So I'll, I'll throw it to you. Uh, did you uh, meet him ever? Oh, yes, I did. In fact, uh, several times. I, I knew him somewhat. I interviewed every single person on the Cosby show. Went to New York quite a few times. Knew Felicia, knew, knew the kids, interviewed them all, interviewed Bill. And um, then I got a story um, which he would not like, I knew. 
It was about a girl that supposedly he was keeping in Las Vegas, got her house, went there to visit. I had pictures, I had the whole thing. And he managed to get the story squelched by calling above my head to the editor and making a deal with him. Um, but uh, the deal was he would do a couple sit-downs with any National Enquirer reporter except Barbara Sternig. <laughs> wow, there we go. So that was the end of my relationships, or as such as they were with, with Bill Cosby himself. But earlier on, back when I was working for Rona, I used to cover a lot of the celebrity stuff, and there was a celebrity tennis, just pro-celeb tennis tournament over here at the West Side Racquet Club, and it was Cosby's. He was hosting it. And I went with a girlfriend of mine, and uh, he kind of took a shine to her at the end. He invited us to meet him. She didn't want to go up ourselves, so I went with her. And he was kind of like all over her at that time. And, you know, but we beat feet because both of us were getting kind of nervous, including her. Later on, I saw some pictures at her house of her and Bill. So I never asked her, but I always wondered what happened after that. Um, that was just kind of a maybe a, a clue to me that he wasn't always on the up and ups as far as faithfulness and all that kind of thing. But uh, he never, he, he wasn't uh, anything like that to me, never. He was always, he was a tough interview, though. i got to tell you, he was not an easy interview. He did not like to give elaborate answers. He talked about whatever he wanted to and wanted to hear questions. He would just kind of give very curt, short answers. He was a, it was like pulling teeth to get your questions in there. <laughs> but, you, but you know, and only because I have never met the man, but from what I've seen on television, he obviously couldn't come off with that persona, being that, you know, he had an image to maintain. So I, I want to say it probably was in print. Probably he would be a little bit more stern or selective or kind of difficult, whereas on TV, I mean, I just saw an interview uh, from the early 90s where he talks about, uh, and I'm blanking, right, uh, Spanish fly, and I had to ask a colleague, oh my not, gosh. and all of a sudden I didn't know what that was, and, you know, <laughs> I'll, let Bar I'll let Barbara look it up, and he mentioned it on the Larry King show, and I thought, Spanish fly, and I said, what is that, an, an old Herb Alpert song, and they said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, no, that's like a drug or a type of sedative or enhancer like that, you know, you would give to a woman. And I'm like, this is 1991. And I'm like, what is he talking about this on the Larry King show? And of course, fast forward 20, 20, almost 30 years later. And I'm like, you know, interesting, you know, interesting. Of course, that could never be brought up as any kind of evidence. But it's just like, you know, I, you know, I'm, I consider myself a pretty hip guy, but I mean, I never even heard of such a term. And, and then I'm saying, you, you got to be kidding me. This is, this is what, what he's talking about? Oh, my. Well, you know, it's, who would have ever dreamed? He was uh, jello. He was, you know, pudding. Pudding pops, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> he was America's dad. He, he was the guy that you wished your dad was like that, you know? I, it's so weird. Uh, who would have, nobody would have ever guessed all of that. Yeah. But it is, it's really, it's just uh, kind of grisly. <laughs> and to be honest with you, there's a case now, and I think people of our generation, and I'm not sure the younger generation gets it, because sometimes they post some pretty stupid things that comes back to bite them. But again, you know, you have to watch every, you know, P's and Q's that you do or say, because you never know when it's going to come back to haunt you. You know what I'm saying? You never and, know, and kids don't realize. Oh, they no, think no. It's a lark, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's another comment I want to make. I, I've, you know, I've been around Hollywood, and I was a cute girl reporter. I was meeting attractive men all the time. You know, I was never jumped. I was never pinned down. You know, not that people didn't sort of flirt with you or try things, but I found in my life that there is a very easy way to protect yourself. It only has two letters, and that is the word no. You, you know, people are not going to drag you up to a hotel room. Don't go. You know, don't don't dress or talk or, or, or act in such a way that it leads people. I, you know, just try to, try to be, I don't even know what the word might be, just be normal. Don't do come-ons. You know, men are men. I, I believe, I like men. I've worked in the world of men my whole life. And 
I like men. Men are, but men have their man things, you know. Girls have to help them be good men. That's what I think. There you go. All right, Barbara. Advice from Barbara. A whole new career. Like uh, <laughs> yes. you've heard of Dear Abby, this is Dear Barbara right here on Dear Studio. Babs. Studio. Dear Babs, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like when people call you Babs? Oh, yeah. That's my nickname. It is. Okay. All right. See, yeah. Okay. Champagne Babs. That's Champagne me. Babs. Oh, boy. Oh, that kind of expensive taste I can I can see it now but she has broad curiosity so make a, make a note of that yeah. all right we wrap up the show with the remaining couple of moments I want to talk about this um, give us some quick insight uh, you actually well while you were at the Enquirer had just left there you went to England or were there when Princess Diana uh, was killed tragically in the uh, car crash uh, that took her life in Dodi Fayed Oh, uh, as yeah. well as their driver. Uh, share in about two minutes, share some thoughts on, on what you saw and, you know, the well, the tremendous, main, tremendous uh, loss. Yes, tremendous loss. Two things will always stick out in my mind. When Elton John, I was standing outside of Westminster Abbey with the British public, you know, and when Elton John sang uh, Goodbye England's Rose, somebody in our crowd there released about a hundred balloons up into the air, and that's an image that I can still see wafting up in the air. And next to me, this big, burly British guy was sobbing like a child. He was a mask of pain and grief, and much unlike the British stereotype of the stiff upper lip. No, people were just really cut up about that. And I definitely wanted to go to the funeral. I paid my own way over there just to be there because I was uh, privileged to be at her wedding, too. I was engaged to a British photographer whose assignment was to photograph the wedding, so I got to be right in in there at the wedding. That there's, That's a chapter in my book, too, all about Princess Diana and those two seminal events, her marriage and her death and funeral. So yeah, she was she was a she was an icon to a lot of women who were suffering in different ways too. They related to her. She we've got a, we've got a photo here in Barbara's book. I don't know if we can get a good shot of that, but just to show again the picture that I'm sure Barbara took. Look at the you know the uh, uh, I don't even know if plumage is the right word. The just tremendous amount of floral arrangements and flowers and uh, you know single roses that were there. I mean I can remember. But, you know, you being there in person, I mean, that must have been just taking your breath away. We saw it, obviously, uh, you know, day and night for almost 10 days, you know, and it just, uh, you know, was, was just beyond belief what had happened. I think a lot of people our age and, and maybe younger remember where they were when she passed. But Oh, absolutely. You know, just, just like uh, if, depending on how old you are, if you remember Kennedy, if you remember the tw Twin Towers and you remember Princess Diana, that's it. Absolutely. Now, uh, we uh, close with, um, uh, you had mentioned uh, Mr. Weinstein, and of course, as we tape, uh, that is still yet to be resolved. But again, uh, uh, the Me Too movement slogan coined, um, oh, who's that young lady? Alyssa Milano, who coined that uh, uh, in a tweet, I believe. And um, again, do you think... Um, in about half a minute we have left. Do you think that the movement still has a long way to go, or do you think that uh, some people think that it's uh, going a little overboard, or do you think it's n just not even reached its peak yet? Well, it probably hasn't reached its peak. I hope it doesn't go overboard and destroy people who don't deserve to be destroyed. Somebody like Harvey Weinstein, somebody like Bill Cosby, these things have to come out. This is just so wrong. But I think there's, you know, there are people who did things long, long ago or didn't do them. They, they, they are accused and ruined. And that's, that's not right. Um, but, you know, I'm glad women are speaking up about these things. It was something that you didn't dare talk about. I mean, um, I had an incident. Well, anyway, I can tell you that story another time. But, yeah, in the olden days, you'd be afraid to speak up because you'd be the one who'd lose your job. Exactly. Not the, exactly. Not the guy. So this is a good thing. It is, as long as it doesn't go too far and become vengeful, become vengeful and use it as a tool for vengeance, uh, that's, that's false, you know? 
Barbara Sternig, author, a senior reporter, of, formerly of the National Enquirer. Uh, and uh, by the way, it even says right here, bonus chapter on Princess Diana at her uh, wedding and at her funeral in person. So celebrity secrets, uh, secrets, secrets, try that again. Celebrity secrets of a National Enquirer reporter, further adventures on the Hollywood beat, uh, published by Front Row Publishing. Barbara, we look forward to having you back on the show again. And thank you so much, Larry. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And you hang in there with us. And we thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Studio 411. Larry De Silva is my name. We look forward to seeing you again. Take care.